Welcome back to the Filthy Report. My name is Jason Filthy Jones, bringing you the dirtiest information with the cleanest style. UFC 254. It's in the books. It's a wrap. Let's get into some fight talk. What's up, guys? Hope your weekend was good. Hope everything is going good for you guys throughout the week. Um, so UFC 254 was a pretty decent card. Had a lot of finishes. Had some amazing events happen to it and had some amazing events happen at the end of it. So, um... Let's get into it, and let's start off with Ian Kutalabov versus Magomed Ungulayev. And on most people's shows, if you were watching or paying attention or listening to any podcast, even on some of the ESPN shows that they were talking, most people were thinking Kutalabov was going to show off how much power and strength and how much of an athlete he was coming into this match and just getting right back to things and uh, pretty much knocking his way into the top 10. But as we see... Things didn't go the way that people mostly planned it. Uh, it looked just kind of terrible for Kutalava. He went in there very aggressive, but not really understanding how to handle um, Angolayev in the cage. Wasn't cutting him off, was actually chasing him down, which made it where he got clipped and he got dropped in the um, beginning of the first round. And then uh, instead of backing off and g grabbing his composure, he... Hop right back on to chase an Angolayev, and Angolayev was able to catch him with another shot and put him down and jump upon him and just ground and pound him out. Now, what it does show that I like in this fight that Angolayev is ready to get it, start working his way into the top 10. What I don't like is the type of call out that Angolayev did. Uh, Let's let's all be real here, guys. We all know that Mauricio Shogunhua, he's probably going to be hanging it up this year. Um, he's been in the game for a long time. I don't really see him chasing after another title shot. He's been floating around in the top ten for a while. I mean, if the UFC wants to book him and that wants to, if he wants to be that for his last fight, or if he, let's just see where Shogun's going. But I do like the call out of Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith is on a two fight skid right now. Uh, he needs to get back up in, uh, into the cage, try to get back up there to a t another title shot. Let's see what he can do. I feel like that would be a really good, decent challenge for Angolayev. And also, I feel like it would be a, kind of a decent fight for Anthony Smith. Hopefully, it would be a three-rounder. I don't think he needs to do any more five-rounders for a minute. And let's see him basically start working his way back up to that title shot. Good matchup right there. Um, next coming up would have to be Stefan Shrew versus Tai Tuavasa. Uh, now, I don't know how to go about this because Stefan Shrew is a really good uh, heavyweight. I've been watching him for a while. He's been in the game for a minute. And he recently had retired and came back. He had the drive that he wanted to fight again. And I don't know if it's just that his chin isn't really holding up anymore or... Just the aggression or the motivation isn't there as much. I'm not sure. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it could have been because the crowd wasn't there. But it just it didn't seem like a decent matchup for him. It seemed like he wasn't able to really deal with Ty's pressure. So, I mean, you you guys saw what happened. Ty basically did everything he can to keep him up close and personal, keeping him in the boxing ranks. So he. Cut him off on the cage, push him up against on the cage, on the fence, holding him there, basically staying in the clinch, doing a little bit of dirty boxing, throwing some knees and trying to pretty much find out where his head was because there's, I mean, they had like a foot in height difference. So he was trying to fill out and get the feeling of where it was. And anytime, even if Struve was able to slip the punches or push off a tie or even get Ty back, Ty was still in a decent enough range where he was able to throw his kicks and be heavy on the leg to make sure that he would make Struve back up a closer to the cage again. And then all hell breaks loose from there. And just Ty's able to hit him with some devastating power and putting Struve out. Uh... What I, I think this fight's really a good fight for Ty. I'm glad he's on back on the winning track, and hopefully he can be knocking on the door to get into that top 10. Let's give him a couple of more fights, maybe two or, two or three more fights. I know he is um, planning to move to the States. He's actually part of Mark Hunt's camp, but he's I'm pretty sure he's planning on moving to the States and going and training at AKA, which I think is a really good fit for him. Um, having the tutelage and coaching of Javier Mendez, 
uh, also Daniel Cormier and a few other people there at AKA would really show him the ropes of where he needs to get to in his career and what he, and the type of talent that he is and really just giving him the confidence to get through and get into that top 10 and let's see where he can go off. It's like basically off to the races with them. On to the next fight. There's not that much you can say about this fight. So I'll just say it this way. Uh, Phil Hawes. Um, if you see his name, please pay attention. He's a phenomenal fighter. He's a knockout artist. He And trust me, it's not just hype. He was on the regional scene for a minute. Uh, all it was was to get to the UFC. That's all he ever wanted to do. Um, got onto Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender. Had a hiccup on the Tuesday Night Contender, bounced back, and it was kind of like a make it or break it for him on this debut. Uh, if he wasn't going to actually get his way into the UFC, he was going to be pretty much done with fighting. And I understand a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people say that it's more because when you have retirement in your head, it's kind of like you just should be done with it. Don't worry about that. Just make sure he's going to be a phenomenal middleweight and be a real shakeup for the division. Let's see what he. Let's see where he goes from here. And getting into the next fight would have to be Alexander Volkov versus Walt Harris. And this fight pretty much played out the way I thought it was going to play out. I when you look at the striking abilities of Walt Harris versus Alexander Volkov, he's just leagues above Walt Harris. Um, he's a better kickboxer. He's also been the Bellator heavyweight champion, so he has really good experience on him. He's been in uh, way longer matches. He's dealt with way stiffer competition. But also, I I just feel that Walt was coming a little bit too aggressive, was just throwing power shots as much as he can to try to get Volkov to basically break out of his game planning. Volkov just sat back and staying patient, keeping... Uh, Walt Harris in basically the kicking range and being able to throw the kicks and rounding it out all the way from the first to the second round and getting into the second round, he just was able to throw a mean teep to the body and it sent Harris to the floor and Volkov was able to finish it there. Um, uh, let's see what's going to happen with the heavyweight division right now. It's looking really good. There was two nice heavyweight fights on this division one in the higher ranks of the top 10, and then the other one just below the top 10. So let's see um, how it basically plays out. We have a little bit of a log jam because we don't know if, if the Francis Nagano and Stipe fight is really going to happen. They did just announce that they're trying to make that. I think they're trying to shoot for in March. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the news. But other than that, um, let's just see how it goes. I, I think Volkov... Is looking really nice. I don't. I don't know who's really not, or who is free in the heavyweight division right now. Uh, let's also see how it goes on the next card because I know Greg Hardy and Marcin Green is on that card. So let's see how that goes. Um, other than that, uh, moving on to the next fight has to be a, a really good co-main event that we need to get into. That would be Robert Whitaker versus Jared Cannonier. Now with this fight, it really did play out the way I just thought it would play out. Um, I think a lot of people are forgetting about how good Robert Whitaker is and that he's not just a really good striker. He's an all-round good fighter. Uh, Jared Cannonier was coming in there with a lot of pressure on him because with Israel saying that if Cannonier could finish off Whitaker, he would get the next title shot. Uh, I think more people are looking at Cannonier because of his evolution in the MMA game. And I'm talking about, remember, when Cannonier got into the UFC, he was in the heavyweight division. He moved down and uh, got into the 205 division, just using that as basically just a weight cut to get the weight off, getting all the way down to 185, which is a phenomenal and showed really good discipline, really good worth ethic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Really good worth ethic. Uh, and I'm just... Saying like I, uh, I broke my concentration. That gets us into the, the co-main event, which is uh, that gets us into the co-main event, which was a phenomenal fight between Robert Whitaker and 
Jerry Cannonier. And I kind of played out exactly the way I thought it would, being that uh, basically a lot of people were overlooking Robert Whitaker, thinking that he was just a really good power striker, but he's a really good all round, pretty much an MOA. Uh, that brings us into the co main event, which was a phenomenal fight between Robert Whitaker and Jerry Cannonier. And it played out pretty much the way I thought it was going to play out. It played out with Robert Whitaker basically showing everybody that you guys must have forgot that he's a really good all-round MMA fighter. Uh, most people would just think that Robert Whitaker just has really good hands, but showing off that he knows how to play the game, showing the veteran experience. And let's not forget, Robert Whitaker was champion for a long while with a lot of injuries, but also two fights with Yo Romero in a five round fight in each of them. So going 50 minutes with Yo Romero and who is a damn savage and stronger than hell. And basically, yeah, you would have to kill the man to separate him from consciousness in that, in that cage. But he did his thing. Robert Whitaker came out, dominated Jared, Jared Cannonier and basically letting Cannonier just stay in there using, try to use his power, throwing all the power shots that he can slipping through Cannonier's punches and just throwing out that jab there. He was knocking Jared Cannonier every single time with that jab. His jab was pinpoint on him. And sneaking in and throwing in the kicks when he wanted to mix them in, showed his dominance from bell to bell. From round one to three, he was doing it great. And also, I think it is also a better thing because Robert Whitaker has been fighting five round fights for how long now? And being able to gauge his, his energy levels and his cardio throughout three rounds, he was able to just devastate him. Um, I I do know that Whitaker, do, he doesn't care if he's fighting for the belt or if he's not fighting for the belt. And he really did admit something in this post fight and also in his pre-fight interviews. Robert Whitaker had a lot of stuff just burning on his shoulders while he was champion. And he was happy to get that load off. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he would like to fight again for the belt. But if you give him another fight, I wouldn't be surprised. And we'll get into more about all that in the middleweight division in the news. But other than that, let's move into the main event fight. And that's going to be Khabib Namagamedov versus Justin Gaethje. Which was a phenomenal fight, even though it was a short fight. But it purely showed how dominant Khabib really is and the type of fighter that he is, that he took one skill asset and showed how good you can be and how much of a level you can compete, even if you do have only one skill set. But here's the thing. Khabib's skill set is the one of the main skills that you need for MMA, and that is going to be a wrestling kind of base. But before we get into all that, Let's talk about how the fight went down. And give, I'm giving it up to Justin Gagey. He is a phenomenal warrior. He went in there and tried to put uh, put a pressure on Khabib and tried to move forward, but Khabib wouldn't even give him the chance. There were Most of the whole first and second round is just going to be Khabib putting on a pace on Justin Gagey, trying to keep him um, not being able to be in kicking range so he can really land a heavy kick to the leg. In the first round, Justin Gagey did throw a couple of leg kicks, but if you guys were really paying attention to detail, he was not really getting a full connection on that kick. He was hitting him in the leg, which was more of a tedious thing, pushing him back. But what Justin was really trying to set up was he was trying to use the kick as a setup to set up it for his hands. So he would be able to throw a left hook from hell and try to put Khabib out. But even when Khabib was getting hit, he was just continuously pushing forward. If you guys look at the first round and you could see Justin Gaethje was completely just out of breath because it was a fast pace throughout the whole five minutes from beginning to end. There was no stop. It was just him cutting, basically getting cut off by Khabib and trying to rotate and turn Khabib around to try to spin him. That was the other reason that some of those shots that Justin was throwing at him wasn't fully connecting and he wasn't able to get to his head or get to the hits that he needed to barely put Khabib out, which then moved into the second round. Justin said, 
bit down on the mouth guard and said, let's go, let's do it. And he went forward and uh, was able to get a really nasty kick on Khabib, which also, if you guys noticed, that did hurt Khabib. And that is why on that next kick, Khabib caught the kick and used it as a takedown. And the transfer that he used to get to his back was phenomenal. And then just, if you don't know in with jujitsu wrestling or anything, those transitions, the, it's, it's about the quickness and being able to set up in the transitions and lock it down. Um, if you hear most jiu-jitsu coaches, even wrestling coaches, it's a uh, position before submission. So you want to get to that position. And the way he glides through those positions and was able to get the mount and then to pull off a triangle mount, <laughs> it's just phenomenal. And literally... Yeah, Justin went out, but it was also because uh, Jason Herzog wasn't in the right angle and wasn't able to see the tap. Yeah, Justin did tap. Um, I give it up to both of them. It was a phenomenal fight. Now, let's get into this about Khabib. Now, what I want you guys to understand is this. Be happy that you guys got to see the dominance that Khabib was, like how I said with his wrestling um, aspects of his techniques and skills, because we'll probably never see that again um and the reason i say that is because it's just uh, a lot of people are saying this right now the level of where mma is right now is just moving and moving fast paced there's stars coming out of the woodwork there's guys all over and there are phenomenal fighters and coming out of russia from dagestan um even from other parts of the uk and everywhere there's phenomenal fighters everywhere and the pure dominance, if you looked across the lightweight division, the 155 division is one of the most top division in any organization because it's just stacked with talent at that uh, weight class because there's a lot of people that are able to cut to that weight class. And to see um, Khabib just dominate the lightweight division in the UFC and never lose and just go 29-0, and 0, phenomenal. But... When people start to ask and people are starting to quote like, oh, is, is this really a retirement? Is this a money ploy or anything? No, that's not the style of Khabib. Um, Khabib is a very honorable man. He's very real. He always is stating that he does not care about the money. It's never been about the money. It's literally about the competition and sport. That's what he loves. And... The worth ethic, the grind, the durability, the continuous pace that he likes to put on people, the pure dominance that he does in the lightweight division. I don't think we'll ever see a fighter again that's going to be like him. Um, and if we do, it's going to be a long while. But uh, I, it was an enjoyment to watch him compete in the USC and to compete at the top of the division and just the fighters that are on his list for his fights of him winning, pure dominance. Now, the sad part is we will never get to see the Tony Ferguson and Khabib fight, which really sucks because I really would love to see that fight. And it really sucks that we're not going to get to see the GSP and Khabib fight. And Khabib's not going to go 30 and 0. Um, He's not, a, he's not a person to go back on his word. So I know he's going to keep that with his mom. And it's just kind of, it's real sad to see him, see him go. Uh, it sucks uh, that his father didn't get to see him retire and defeated. I know um, it's really emotional for everybody that's uh, around him. So all I can say is, well done, Khabib. You are the number one fighter in the world you are pound for pound the king of fighters give it up to him and can't wait to see where he goes next with his what he's going to be doing in his life all right guys with all that being said let's get into this fight breakdown for this fight this weekend ufc fight night uriah hall versus anderson silva and i have to admit guys this card looks phenomenal already it's uh looking like to be shaping up to a decent card which is going to be moving a lot of the divisions in the UFC, getting them prepared for 2021. So at the beginning of the card, we got Bobby Green versus Tiago Moises. All right, and with this fight, I'm looking at it this way. Tiago Moises is a pretty decent fighter. He has some all right hands. He's better on. He has a 
better jujitsu. But I'm going to say it this way. If anything, I would go for Bobby Green. And the reason I'm saying this is, if you guys saw Tiago Moises' last fight where he fought Michael Johnson, he was literally getting the ba brakes beat off of him from um, the beginning almost to the end until he was able to catch Michael Johnson in a heel hook and basically get Michael Johnson out of there. Um, I don't see him having the skills to handle Bobby Green, and Bobby Green has been a phenom since he since the beginning of this pandemic. He has been fighting nonstop, continuously, and I think it's actually a better thing for him to fight at a, fa uh, at a faster pace or a faster schedule, if you want to put it that way. And also, I think it might be better without the crowd for him because uh, he's staying focused, staying driven. Hands are looking good. Uh, his wrestling is looking really damn good. And uh, cardio is looking phenomenal. He's coming in shape every single time. Uh, I just don't think he, that Tiago Moises has the skills to beat Bobby because Bobby is an all-round complete fighter. And the other thing is I love Bobby because he's also just like a Nate Diaz, a Nick Diaz, or Jorge Masvidal, any of those type of guys that like to type, talk crap throughout the whole fight in the cage just to get in your head to break you off a game plan and be able to take it to you. So go with Bobby Green and make sure you catch that fight. Um, the next fight after that is going to be Maurice Green versus Greg Hardy. Now, with this fight, um, I'm pretty much going to be going with Greg Hardy. And I know everybody's, we've all heard the stories about Greg Hardy, the past history, the court history, the football history. With all that aside, he's actually turning into a really good MMA fighter. He's shown that he has really good cardio. His hands are looking better. He's really heavy-handed. And that can go really far in the heavyweight division. Um, with Marcin Green, uh, I, his cardio hasn't been that great. He hasn't shown that uh, much decent cardio. So it's hard for me to go uh, with him. He does have some pretty decent hands, but... If anything, I'm going to go with Greg Hardy. I think Greg Hardy gets him out of there. The next fight after that, you have Kevin Holland and... I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to probably butcher his name. It's... M Minecraft Mondorf. It, it's really hard name. Sorry, guys. But bear with me on that one. Uh, but I will tell you guys, I am taking Kevin Holland in this fight. Kevin Holland is a really good uh, striker. And also, he has phenomenal jiu-jitsu. Um, he is another fighter that I like that's just like how Bobby Green is and like how Nate Diaz and Nick Diaz and all them are. He likes to talk mess in the cage. And he's been fighting really good without having um, the crowd in, uh, in the arena. I just see him coming off and getting the win in that one. And then from there, we have a really, really phenomenal co-main event, which is going to be... Um, Bryce Mitchell versus Andre Touchy Feely. Uh, and Andre Feely is a fighter coming out of Sacramento, out of Alpha Male, which is Uriah Faber's camp. He has really, really good striking. He's been fighting some of the top level opponents for a while. He's been always floating in and out of the top 10. And it's a really big test for Bryce Mitchell. But trust me right now, guys, if Feely ends up on the floor, he is going to be in a world of trouble with Bryce Mitchell. He has really damn good jiu-jitsu. Um, he also has okay hands, but he is a very aggressive, uh, has a lot of heart, and is always moving forward, hard to get off of you, stays on you, trying to get you to the floor, and pulls off some of the most phenomenal submissions all the time. This man has hit twisters continuously through rounds in the cage just keep your eyes on this co-main event i don't know who really to go with but i do know this is your old school kind of striker versus grappler it's going to be a phenomenal fight now with all that being said that gets us into the main event which is going to be uriah hall versus anderson silva now i know um at a time and point people were saying how uh, Israel Asanya versus Anderson Silva felt like more of the passing the torch and kind of because it seems like it would be uh, Adesanya who's going to carry on just to be like Anderson Silva holding that middleweight belt for a long time. But if you guys remember back in the day when uh, Uriah Hall was on The Ultimate Fighter, 
He was a phenomenal striker who was shocking the world on the Ultimate Fighter to where everybody started calling him the next Anderson Silva. Now, years down the line, with a few hiccups and Uriah Hall not always showing up to the fight, meaning showing up mentally to the fight, being able to take what he takes from the practice room into the main event fight or into the main fights in the bright, in the bright lights. But to me, this feels more of like the passing of the torch. Now, if Uriah Hall, the savage, devastating, come in your face, it hits you hard, not, not stopping, not backing down comes out, trust me, this, this Uriah Hall will be able to uh, knock out Anderson Silva and also, the only reason I'm saying that he would probably be able to knock out Anderson Silva is also, yes, Anderson Silva was a phenomenal fighter. He's a little bit older. His, his um, speed, his reaction times, they're not all there like how he used to be when he was younger. So, and the other thing is, it also seems like he has his foot out the door because he's talking about retirement. He's talking about how this could be his last fight, but also he's hinting at that it might not be his last fight because he might just not be fighting in the UFC anymore. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I will be picking Uriah Hall in this fight just because I feel like he's really going to show up to this fight. He needs to make a statement so he can get in line to actually try to go for a title shot. So let's see how it goes. All right, guys, with all that being said, let's get into this news. The news this week and the biggest news of this week has to be Khabib retiring. And with Khabib retiring, meaning that the lightweight championship in the UFC is up for grabs. And I hear a lot of people stating that um, they should just throw the belt onto the fight with Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier. Even though I don't feel that's right because Conor McGregor is not even trying to fight that fight at 155. He's actually trying to fight it at 170. And so it gives me the question of, is Conor going to be able to cut the weight to 155? And also, there's a lot of other things that are going on. I understand the UFC doesn't like putting on tournaments. They don't always wonder, they don't think tournaments can go correctly because people don't even seem like they can make it all the way to the actual fight itself. So I get it. There shouldn't, there, they can't have a tournament. But I feel like there is a, sort of like a tournament Grand Prix going on. You have... Tony Ferguson, Michael Chandler, Justin Gaethje, um, who else is there? Dan Hooker, Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor, uh, if you want to throw Ally Quinta in there, Paul Felder, and the one dark horse that nobody's talking about, Charles Oliveira. He is on a fight win streak right now and has the most submissions in the UFC I don't know how you can overlook that man, but trust me, any of these guys on any given night can beat any other person. It just depends on who shows up that night and they can take on the title. But I feel like they should have some kind of tournament or at least have two or three fights set up and let's get some fights setting to get in line. That title can be up for grabs, but be handled with in the next few months. And I, at the beginning of the year, I would say you could have an actual huge championship. But I just don't feel that the belt should just be top, thrown on top of uh, the Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor fight. But I will tell you guys this. I do feel like Dustin Poirier is the one that should be fighting for the title. And that is because Dustin lost to Khabib, came back, beat Dan Hooker, and beat Dan Hooker dominantly. And is actually on a winning streak. So out of everybody that's on that fight um, ranking right now that I just stated, I think the only two that are on a fight win streak right now would be Dustin Poirier and Charles Oliveira, if I remember correctly. Not exactly sure. Don't quote me completely on that, but yeah. And so after that, the other fight news that's been um, out there that have been some fight announcements is um, the Rob Font and Mar uh, Marlon Marais fight got made. I do like that fight. I think it's going to do some really good uh, movement through the Bantamweight division, and it's a good test for Rob Font right now. 
Now, the fight that's sitting on the top of that card, I don't like because I don't like how it was made, but we'll just leave it at sometimes the rankings really suck and that's just how it goes. But it's going to be the Leon Edwards versus Hamzat Shemaev fight. Now, the only thing I have to say about this is if Leon Edwards comes out beating Hamzat Shemaev, they really need to toss him a title fight because I feel like they've been skipping him over continuously. And Leon Edwards is no punk and no slouch. He's a really good fighter and he deserves to fight for that title. But anyways, all that beside all that, I would say the one thing that the other people need to be worried about, I get it. I, even I'm on the um, Hamza Shemaev uh, hype train. But at the same time, don't take for granted Leon Edwards. Hamza Shemaev has only had, I think, three fights in the UFC. And yes, I think he might be undefeated. But let's put it this way. The skill level of the fighters that Hamzat has been fighting to the skill level of fighters that Leon Edward has been fighting, totally different. Can't wait to see the fight. And I'm already going to be probably on the record for saying that I'm probably going to be choosing Leon Edwards in that fight, even though I like Hamzat. Other um, fight announcements that were being made were uh, like the heavyweight division. They're saying that they're trying to get the fight book for March for Stipe versus Francis Ngannou. Um, hoping that that's how it's going to play out. We'll see how it goes. But it also seems that Francis is tired of waiting around. Um, we'll see. There's. I just hope there's some kind of movement. And I hope it starts at the beginning of the year of 2021 since we can't get it at the end of this year. Now, the other big information and big news that came out was Everybody's talking about with Robert Whitaker winning that he deserves the next title shot, which I do understand Robert Whitaker does deserve the next title shot, but it doesn't seem like Robert Whitaker really wants the title shot. And also, on the other half of that, Israel Alassane isn't interested in fighting Robert Whitaker again, stating that he feels that he already solved that puzzle and doesn't feel that Robert Whitaker has anything to offer him to actually make him feel like he's a challenge for him. So what's Izzy talking about? Izzy's talking about that the challenge that he's looking at now is going up to 205 and fighting Young Bohovlich, which in the long run, that could be something really interesting. And the reason being that is the fight, if Izzy beats Bohovlich, that comes after that would probably be Israel Asanya versus John Jones. Now, if I, if I was his manager or if I was talking to him, I get it, that fight's huge. We can let it fester a little bit, but I would rather see him fight the winner of Darren Till and Jack Hermanson. And um, yeah, the winner of Darren Till and Jack Hermanson and see and take that title fight for Izzy. And if Izzy beats that one, then he can move on and fight in the light heavyweight division, maybe build up a little bit more weight get into light heavyweight division and take on Jan Blahovic. And if he can catch the 205 title, then he can uh, go ahead and take on John Jones. We'll see how it plays out. Not really sure. Not sure how Dana White's going to handle that. But I won't be surprised if in the beginning of the year, we see Izzy fighting Jan Blahovic. Other than that, that's all I got for you guys this week. Like always, thank you for coming and watching The Filthy Report. Always, always like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, guys, I am Jason Filthy Jones, bringing you the dirtiest information with the cleanest sound. Peace.